from Belgium. Vincent is from Belgium and he received his bachelor's and MS degrees in bioengineering from the University of uh, Leuven. Sorry, about Vincent, if I'm saying that wrong, uh, magnum cum, cum laude. Uh, he then went on for his PhD at the University of Ghent in Belgium, but he spent much of his graduate studies at Michigan State University working with Jim Tg in the Center for Microbial Ecology, that's arguably the foremost microbial uh, ecologist in the premier institution for microbial ecology in the US at that time. My, my, my. He then went on to do a postdoc at UC Berkeley with Jill Banfield. Uh, Jill, I consider a visionary who's been a major force in founding and advancing the field of metagenomics, which provides powerful insights into the microbial world, which of course holds the vast majority of biodiversity on our planet. And as a postdoc, Vincent was a key player in game-changing developments that now underpin the study of microbiomes in many different fields. Uh, to me, some of the big advances that he played a role in is he discovered uh, genome and proteome wide mechanisms of divergence between closely related strains as they exist in a real microbial community. So this shed light on early stages of microbial speciation as it occurs in the wild. And this was reported in a series of uh, high profile papers in Nature and PNAS. Um, here at Vincent, here at Vincent, here at Michigan, Vincent has applied these cutting edge tools to aquatic microbial communities. And so he's continued to advance the field with major impacts on our understanding of fundamental microbial ecology and evolution. He's leading the way in understanding how invasive muscles are influencing microbial communities in their roles in, especially in lake ecosystems. And much of his research now is focused on phytoplankton, especially understanding the relationship between phenotype and genotype, and especially in an ecological context as it relates to speciation. Most recently, he's become interested in how algae interact with bacteria and how these microbiomes influence competitive interactions among algae, which is what we're gonna hear about today. So Vincent has published over 60 papers in top journals with a number of those receiving special recognition. His students and postdocs have gone on to faculty positions at top universities like UCSD and Cornell. So this is a testament to his mentoring and his standing in the field. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Vincent and ask you to please join me in congratulating and welcoming Vincent. Congrats, Vincent. Well, thank you, Greg. That was, uh, I think that's uh, the biggest celebration I've had of, of my tenure, I think, in this, in this awkward year. Um, so, so thank you. It was very, um, very kind and very uh, fun to listen to. It's like, oh yeah, I've, I've, done some, I've done some good things. Thank you. So it makes me feel better. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, and, and Greg, you know, didn't mention there that we yeah. So we met as graduate uh, students on on uh, in, in Woods Hole, actually at the uh, MBL course in microbial diversity, and, and so it's been really fun since our paths have crossed there, and then they crossed uh, at Berkeley, where we were both postdocs in the same lab for for a short time. Greg came in with already a faculty job in his back pocket, so that was kind of a neat uh, a neat treat there. And then he came to Michigan, and I followed. So it's been been really fun to have you know or paths intersecting and then also now collaborating um, together with, with him and his group. Um, so, um, so yeah, thank you uh, to Greg and thank you to um, all the colleagues that voted um, to keep me around. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to contribute in a, in a positive way, both scientifically as well as, as um, you know, in service to the department, um, you know, uh, the students, uh, staff in our department uh, as well. Uh, so I want to start this with, with tenure thank yous and particularly, um, you know, all the people in the lab. I guess the first thing I wanted to say, like, if we had been in person, um, I would have been providing fresh, that had been my plan to make like freshly baked croissants and chocolate croissants, which for a little while I ran a little mini bakery out of my, my kitchen and sold them at a local farmer's market here in, in, uh, in Webster Township. Um, but so I guess this means you're going to have to promote me another time if, if you want that treat. So I guess I got that uh, in my sleeve. Um, anyway, so, so I want to start out with, you know, science is never an individual endeavor uh, and, and definitely not um, in my case and, and in most people's cases, I guess. And, and so the only way to get here is because of the wonderful people that have, have done so much of the work and that I've worked with. And, and 
So, you know, they include postdocs in lab, Sarah and Masa, our graduate students, Marian, Nikesh, Ginny, and Ruben, who's at the University of Ghent, but I, I co-advised. Um, technicians that, you know, some of them had been undergrads here first in the lab and, and then became technicians in the lab, including Michelle, Anne, uh, Jacob, Catherine, Edna, Dylan, Nate, and Lang. Um, and then a whole series of undergraduate students. There's some fantastic students at this university, uh, very eager to participate in research, uh, both through the undergraduate research opportunity program as well as independently. Um, and so, so it's been really a pleasure to have people like Catherine, Adna, Dylan, Nate, Lang, um, Anna, James, Chloe, Cassandra, Rachel, Kristen, Kyle, Morgan, Amadeus, Joe, uh, Shauna, Michelle, Amelia, Natalie, Catherine, and Hura. Um, um, join the lab at different phases, you know, um, um, of their time here. Um, also, uh, you know, obviously thank the colleagues, but then also the administrative staff, you know, that, that plays such a key role in, in providing all the support that make things uh, much more easy and allows us to focus on research and teaching and less on the other things. Um, and then definitely also the collaborators. Uh, it's, you know, throughout my career, I've always worked in, in teams, uh, in collaborative contexts. Uh, and that's been no different here, and I don't plan to change that anytime soon. Um, you know, it's how I find my ideas getting better and, and, and synergies in, in people's competencies can, can really shine. And so, you know, Greg and his lab, uh, also I'm very lucky to be married to somebody I can also work with. Um, and we do not too much of it uh, to ensure we show independence, uh, but, you know, we do work together on some projects. And even on the ones we don't formally work with, it's great to have somebody that I can sound off ideas um, um, and concerns. And then definitely we have wonderful people at, um, at uh, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, which is a NOAA lab here in Ann Arbor, and then the Center for, um, you know, for Great Lakes Research, uh, according to uh, for Great Lakes Research here, that is uh, based in Seas, where we have, you know, Hank and Tom, Casey, Regan, um, Work and then also other collaborators include Brad, where I've done a lot with Brad Cardinal, um, and then Jeff White, Ace Nally, uh, both at Michigan State back then, and then uh, uh, Bobby Bidan at Grand Valley State. Anyway, so it's a little bit of a lengthy uh, start there, but I, you know, I thought specifically for for this talk that commemorates the my transition from assistant to associate professor, um, I wanted to start. That was the most important thing. So now you can tune out, but um, you know it's. I, I, Found it important to to recognize all the people that, that played primary roles in getting me to where I am right now. Um, okay, um, so for today's talk, so I'll, I'll you know um, I'm going to focus on on where a lot of or the attention our lab is currently focused on, um, and the title could have been microbiomes alter competitive interactions between their hosts because we're interested in this question beyond algae, we use algae as the model system uh, to address a question, you know, more fundamental to, to all of life. Um, okay, so I'll go over a little bit of shortly why I study freshwater microbes. Um, then, okay, talking about algae, so does a mi can a microbe have a microbiome? Doesn't that sound a little bit weird? So we'll go over that a little bit and then talk a bit about how microbiomes change interspecies interactions and then some thoughts in the end on what role they might play in harmful algal blooms uh, on which we have our big collaboration with Greg, Melissa and the people at GLURL. Um, okay, so why study freshwater, microbi uh, freshwater microbes? So, okay, what do we do? We study the lakes. Um, it's fun to be in Michigan because it's the prettiest state of them all. Um, you know, nice contours. We study big lakes and we study how tiny creatures matter for these big lakes. Okay, so that's how you can sort of um, in elevator pitch, I guess, uh, um, say what we do. Uh, but it might be, it's still worthwhile always to ask that question like, okay, why on earth would you bother studying microbes in lakes? Okay, so first of all, why study lakes when most of earth is not lakes, right? Most of the earth is uh, oceans, so maybe we should study that. Or, you know, at least if you're gonna study something on land, you know, study the actual land and not that little bit of puddles of water in there. No. Obviously, we all know that we drink water, and so uh, freshwater lakes, freshwater environments, freshwater overall is, of course, an incredibly important resource uh, for humans. And the quality of that water is really determining or really impactful on um, human health. Um, and this here is a picture. Uh, the person on the top there is, uh, let's see if, yeah, this one here. 
is uh, the former mayor of Toledo. Uh, this was in 2014, a couple of days after uh, there had been for several days no water available to their residents because of the water of Lake Erie, which they dry, uh, derived their water from looking like this, right? Uh, with massive uh, toxic harmful algal bloom uh, going on that uh, had been sucked up into the water intake systems and at you know, toxin levels that would kill you. Uh, and so here is showing that you can drain the tap water safely again. But again, so those are microbes impacting water quality. And so um, another one is animal health. Um, so this is pretty old data here, but uh, you can sort of see that even though the wild caught fish in freshwater systems isn't very high, uh, aquaculture definitely contributes a significant amount. In freshwater systems, it contributes a significant amount to total fish catch. Now, you know, whether these numbers are totally up to date or not, um, you know, um, the main point here is there is a significant element of food production in these kind of systems. And again, microbes can be major disease agents for um, uh, fish and obviously beyond things that are an extraction industry like, like fisheries. Um, overall, you know, microbes play a really important um, element in freshwater animal health. Uh, and again, you know, another reason why one might want to study them. And then ecosystem health, what you see here on these pictures are um, an aerial picture of a lake, um, a system of, of lakes in northern um, uh, Wisconsin, uh, where you sort of see uh, land use there. Uh, and what you can see on the one next to it is how much carbon is stored in these different animals. And you actually see a much darker color where the lakes are. So lakes contain a, are a big reservoir of carbon in the terrestrial environment and uh, what you see here also by these warmer colors where the lakes are, there's actually net emissions of CO2 coming from these systems. And that's both from off-gassing of um, terrestrial DIC as the groundwater comes into the system, and that's DIC produced in soils, often by microbes as well, um, as well as in situ degradation of organic carbon that comes in by terrestrial subsidies into these lake systems. Um, that lead to these net emissions. And if you look on a global, uh, on a global scale, even though freshwater only covers about 1% of the Earth's surface, uh, the net CO2 emissions from these systems rival the net uptake by the oceans, even though the total fluxes in the oceans are much larger. Um, so, so that's another element of where, you know, and microbes being key drivers of biogeochemical cycles in all systems, including in water, makes is another reason why one might care about microbes and freshwater systems. Okay, so I kind of look back at my job talk in uh, 10 years ago, more or less exactly. Um, 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 and uh, when we just look at the themes, I talked about sort of freshwater lakes and global carbon cycle, uh, in particular how global change played or could change things. And then a second was sort of co-evolution of fish gut communities and their hosts. If we look what I actually did, um, you know, the first one, it, you know, initially I was thinking more in a climate change perspective and a much more global, you know, basin wide uh, analysis of what's happening in the Great Lakes. But then Maureen Coleman sort of at University of Chicago really launched a big program in that. And, and so in thanks actually in big part to conversations with Mark Hunter in the summer before I got here at, uh, at, uh, at the UMBS, uh, got my attention sort of focused on, on the role of these um, dracinid mussels, so invasive quagga and zebra mussels, and how they might change things um, in, in lake ecosystems. And I won't talk in detail about that today, um, but so a big thing that they do is that, uh, which you see on the image over here, is of an overlay in, in July 99, you still had really high warm colors, so you have high levels of chlorophyll in, this is a transect in Lake Michigan that we study, while in uh, 2010, essentially that spring phytoplankton bloom or that early summer phytoplankton bloom had been completely obliterated through filter feeding. And so we're kind of studying how there's a change interconnectivity between um, the microbial and the higher food web um, and potentially some kind of level of compensation by heterotrophs in these systems uh, uh, to sustain the food web and fisheries in the system. Um, we have some interest in geochemical cycling. Uh, Marion had some work related to that. Um, also impacts on avian botulism is a smaller project funded by the National Park Service um, that we kind of look at. And then a, a big emphasis here on the interaction between algae and harmful algal blooms. And um, Nikesh, uh, as many of you know, right, grad student in the lab right now is, is sort of focused on that element. Um, I will talk today more about theme two. And while I didn't end up working on whitefish radiation in, in, in the lakes and you know, connection with microbiomes, um, 
we still kind of got to a similar question in a different system, uh, which is the questions on how microbiomes might be manipulating interspecies interactions between their eukaryotic hosts. Okay, and we have a variety of people are working on that actively right now, where the question sort of is like, if you have, and just kind of showing it for, for algae here, right, two different algal species, if we have these two species alone without their bacteria that are associated with them, um, is the outcome of interaction the same as when there are microbes present? Okay, so gets us to this microbe microbiomes, right? So um, kind of studying the impacts of microbiomes on their hosts, right? A lot of work has been done on how do microbiomes affect the physiology and fitness of a host. But we take that one step further, trying to think like, okay, how does it change the way these hosts interact with each other? And in recent years, there's been some really neat work in plants also kind of uh, uh, addressing similar questions and others are interested in other systems as well. Uh, so we use uh, phytoplankton as a model system for that for a couple of reasons. They are ecologically important in their own right, right? Phytoplankton produce about half of uh, the planet's oxygen Right? Um, so there's, there's a good reason to be interested in them and figuring out what's happening um, and what controls their diversity and their composition. Uh, they've been used as a, a model system for developing numerous theories in, in uh, ecology. Um, and then uh, we know, so this is through collaboration with Brad Cardinal, so he's done a lot of work developing this system to kind of apply chess and synthesis of models of competition and calculate niche differences and relative fitness differences. Um, okay, so, okay, but I said microbiome, right? And so microbiome, when <clears throat> people hear that phrase, that term, they probably typically will think about human microbiome maybe, right, because that gets a lot of attention. And you can see, okay, the humans and then your gut, you have a bunch of microbes and live closely associated, that's clear. But when you're talking about algae, they are microbes themselves, right? So can they have, do they have microbiomes, right? And so, so there's quite a bit of work done on this in recent years. And so it's called the phycosphere uh, where um, phytoplankton provide organic carbon uh, primarily to a bacterial community. Uh, these bacteria actually get chemotactically attracted to uh, the algae and, and will recruit to them. Uh, there's some competition possible between them uh, and, and, but the bacteria also provide a variety of micronutrients, uh, remineralizing macronutrients and providing um, uh, micronutrients uh, to them as well as some compounds like vitamins. Um, some people might be more familiar, uh, definitely the plant people in, in the department with the idea of a rhizosphere, right? So it's like the area around uh, the root of a plant where you have a close association of uh, uh, bacteria where you have these similar kind of exchanges happening. And so the same is idea, the same idea is true for a phycosphere. It's exactly the same idea at somewhat different scales. Um, and so then the question is, do phycosphere bacteria, right? So the microbiome of, of, of um, uh, phytoplankton uh, regulate uh, host population dynamics. So that's the first question that we want to ask just to kind of see if we want to call this a microbiome, they do need to have some form of an impact. They're not just some things that are around there, but they need to impact the host. So the question is, is the host by itself the same as the host plus bacteria or not? Um, so when you pull an algae from the environment or an algal cell from the environment, they will have these closely associated bacteria with them. And so even if you try to buy an azenic, so azenic means uh, free or, or like a, a species by itself. Uh, when you buy that from a culture collection, typically what they call azenic means uni algal. There's only one algal species in it. But very often there will be still an associated bacterial community. And so we developed some methods using um, flow cytometry, single uh, cell sorting um, to kind of, you know, get rid of, you know, we sonicate the bacteria off them and then sort them cell by cell, grow them back up. And then with a couple of screening methods, we would go from a place where it's kind of hard to see um, the alg algal cells here don't show up very well um, 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 because there's much stronger signal coming from a fluorescently stained bacteria in the surrounding uh, environment. Uh, but you can see the algae here showing up and no more bacteria while there are in the Xenic case, which means there are bacteria present. Okay, and so what we see then, if we do this for a series of different algal cultures and we bring bacteria, uh, we have um, bacteria free, this is um, a growth yield here based on fluorescence. Uh, we see that these organisms grow slower and to lower yields, 
than when you have bacteria present. So the bacteria seem to be stimulating, having a positive effect on the growth of, um, of the host. And so we are doing this in a lot of different ways, also looking at single isolates. Uh, Ginny Yang, graduate student in the lab, is developing a project looking at how bacteria, um, you know, there might be a trade-off between strong mutualists and strong competitors. So meaning the comp competition between different bacteria in the microbiome and how the algae might play a role in trying to re, um, reset these interactions. Um, anyway, so lots of fun projects, including undergraduates that work on that. Um, but overall, the idea is, okay, they have a positive effect on growth. Um, not always uh, positive, but they definitely, uh, in most cases that we looked at, it is positive. Uh, another element is also, okay, well, are these things associated, are they really specific microbiomes recruited by these algae, or are they just sort of generic things? Doesn't really, you know, whatever. They're just bacteria, they remineralize, sure, whatever, but they're not really in any way specific. Uh, which is another question that for us is sort of, you know, for us to be calling true microbiomes, there needed to be some level of host specificity. Um, so in other words, these bacteria, right, are they the same for these different hosts or are they different? Um, and so we did an experiment that was led by postdoc Sarah Zuckrell in the lab, and she went to, you know, took water from a couple of different ponds at the George Reserve, um, um, you know, and then brought these in the lab in a controlled setting. So, and then, you um, put these ball jars with uh, three micron filters that wouldn't let algae through, but would let bacteria through, uh, and then kind of have different algal hosts present in these different source communities and see what happens. So these were azenic algal cultures, and then we would look at what bacteria were there. So after three days of exposure, they were brought, um, uh, called a recolonized phagosphere. These were then brought into uh, growth media in the lab, kind of a common garden set up then, and transferred a couple of times and then tracked over time to see what happens with the community over time. Uh, one thing that we see is that if you have the pond water, um, here's a richness, this is based on sequencing surveys uh, of marker genes, we can see a range, but you know, reasonably high taxon richness um, and of bacteria uh, that are present in the pond. And then we look actually what's present in these ball jars. Um, uh, recruited to the algae, uh, and we see that there's a subset of all taxa that are out there that is present in the flasks, and that further reduces over time. Uh, this could be both due to further selection by the host or also by drift. Um, you know, we do transfers uh, each time, which is only a subset of the whole community, and so rare members might be lost in that way. Um, Okay, so if we look at community composition, uh, what you see here, uh, this was the um, called tank here, but these are the different ponds uh, in initial composition. Then this, you see a shift in community composition uh, on this uh, PCOA um, showing a shift um, after three days. And then as you bring them now, this is still kind of the pond environment, but just in the secluded uh, ball jars that you know will have the same, um, environmental conditions as the pond has, but um, you know, just one algal species there. Uh, then we bring them in these lab media and that over time we get a further shift um, in community composition. So time has a significant effect with, with more limited effect of, um, of um, the original community. Uh, more importantly, the question that we had was, is this different, right? So we had five different algal species that we used. Um, and so the question then was like, okay, is it just, there's an algal species there that's gonna recruit a certain community that's different, that's a subset of the whole pond community, bacterial community, um, but it's not gonna be any different between you know, algal species one, two, three, four, or five. Or do we see a difference? And what we see actually is that um, um, the host explains uh, the, uh, a large extent of the variation and more than the original uh, environmental community, the variation that was present between the different ponds that we took the water from, um, so the host has a stronger effect or on, or the host explains a larger amount of the variation that we see in community composition across all our samples. Uh, and this shows it both when you include this pond and when you exclude it, because a lot of variance is obviously present um, between what's recruited in these, in these ball jars versus what's uh, there in the, in the environment. Okay, so that indicated that the host species explains most of the microbiome community variability. So that for us, that's just a, you know, kind of 
giving a little bit of a view on the system and indicating, okay, we call these microbiomes because they're specifically recruited to a certain host and then seem to be having a beneficial effect on the fitness of that host. Okay, so then the question that's next then is, okay, so to some extent that's no, not very different from what we've seen in other cases. We could more experimentally control, um, do more con experimentally controlled experiments uh, for looking at this host specificity, which has been hard in a lot of other systems. Uh, so that was neat. Um, uh, but the idea that microbiomes impact host physiology, okay, that's nothing new. But uh, the question that is newer is sort of the idea of like, okay, um, do if they affect their host, do they also affect the way that host interacts with other hosts, which are of course themselves influenced by their microbiomes, or is it all just a wash? Um, okay, so why do are we interested in that question? Um, if we look in North Temperate Lakes, we have these seasonal transitions between different groups of phytoplankton. And also within each of these groups of phytoplankton, there are transitions between different species. Uh, and some will coexist, some will not. Um, and so question then is what control species interactions within and between these groups that, that, ex that determine the succession. And we know a lot about this. Nutrients are key, light is important, temperature is important, right? Um, but we also wondered about whether the microbiome plays a role in there. Uh, that we haven't appreciated this far. Now, again, always good to ask why care, right? Um, again, going back, phytoplankton are ecologically and important and composition matters. Uh, if we look at overall ecosystem productivity, right? So you have algal communities that are the base of the aquatic food web. Um, so that's a reason to care about the fact that there's a healthy community of phytoplankton and uh, why is it important to understand species interactions? Well, that kind of goes back to the idea of uh, if you have a more diverse community that can be sustained based on diverse ecosystem functioning relationships, uh, particularly for primary producers, um, then uh, you know, a more diverse community would be, uh, would be beneficial to, to maintain a more productive system overall. Um, so their species interactions are key to determine overall community composition and, and diversity. Um, so community composition by itself, also which algae are present is also important. And we'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about harmful local blooms. Um, okay, so thus far until now, people had, you know, people have thought a lot about this obviously, um, uh, about species interactions, including within, um, within phytoplankton systems. Um, but typically people think about this as something, okay, to explain why we see certain type of interaction coefficients or why we see coexistence or competitive exclusion, uh, we focus mostly on the traits expressed by the algal species. Or similarly for any other eukaryotic host, we would think about the traits of that host species. It is what we should think about if we want to understand um, why we see a certain outcome of interaction. Um, we argue that you should also look at the traits encoded by their microbiomes if you want to have a fuller picture. Um, okay, so that's in the question, right? To what extent do bacteria, okay, we want to, we can make that point all we want, but if we don't kind of address and, and try to test the question, um, so what? So, um, so to what extent do bacteria associated with algal hosts influence species interactions? And, and to do this, we um, uh, use this mutual invasibility criterion uh, to kind of look at coexistence. And so if we have, um, um, I guess I should, well, it's okay. If we have uh, two algal species, A and B, right? Um, then we use a sensitivity measure in these mutual invasibility experiments, which is the idea that you can measure the growth rate of A when it grows alone. You measure the uh, growth rate, maximum growth rate of B when it grows alone. And then you add A to B when it's at steady state. Um, um, at a very low concentration as sort of the invading species um, to kind of, and then measure its growth rate um, in the presence of B, of an established B, right? And then basically subtract that from A when it grows alone. You do the same thing for B, right? When B invades and compare that to when B is alone. And then you compare that and look at that relatively to when it grows alone. So, um, um, this metric will be um, you know, zero if, um, if, if it's not, if um, 
mu a invading is the same as mu a alone, right? Or it'll be, um, you know, um, um, you know, it'll be one if there's maximum sensitivity, I guess. Okay. All right, and so we did these experiments. These are experiments that um, uh, Brad had done a lot on, on um, uh, with his phytoplankton collection, but this phytoplankton collection was xenic, so there were bacteria present. So he's done these experiments essentially in this setting, and we wanted to compare, well, what if we strip the bacteria away? Do we get the same outcome? Or was some of the things that you saw before, uh, not just because of the algae, uh, but uh, because of the bacterial presence as well. And so in this case, we used the whole bacterial communities that were associated with them um, in the lab already. Um, okay, so we had four species in this case, and then we look at all pairwise comparisons where we have, um, you know, here, um, monofridium uh, minutum, um, and then um, we look at, well, here it's each time, um, uh, sorry, Celestrum microporum invading um, monofridium, invading uh, Selenastrum, and invading uh, Synodesmus. Um, and what is plotted here, and that's, that's shown also for the other uh, species each time invading each other one. Um, what we are looking for is the change in sensitivity to the established species when it is xenic, so when bacteria are present, relative to when it's azenic, right? So we calculate the sensitivity, the sensitivity metric by doing the experiments both when there's bacteria present and when they're absent. And now we're looking at is this sensitivity measure in any way affected by the presence of bacteria? And what we expect is, or what, we, what the result would be if, if uh, sensitivity goes down in the presence of bacteria, that means that microbiome seems to uh, facilitate the invading species. So it makes it easier for the invader to grow in the presence of an established species. If it would go up, it'd be the other around, it would be increasing sensitivity. And so what we see, either there was no effect or uh, when there was an effect, it was a decrease in the sensitivities and it's showing all the replicates here, it was a decrease in the sensitivity um, of um, the invader to the presence of an established species. Um, so based on six cases where the microbiome seems to be facil facilitating, six cases, no effect, and no cases where there seemed to be a negative effect of the presence. So um, overall, it seemed these host-associated bacteria were affecting metrics that were, we thought were inherent to the hosts, right? By, in this case, lowering uh, sensitivities in many cases, and so facilitating algal growth when rare. Um, so these were large enough that they might, in theory, affect composition. Um, they were not large enough for these particular groups that we looked at in the particular microbiomes that we used. Uh, to make a switch between coexistence and competitive exclusion, which is something that right now we're in the process of, of, uh, of modifying a proposal together with um, Annette Ostling, uh, Nina Lin and Brad Cardinal on you know, kind of taking the next steps in that. And, and so this work was published earlier this year in, in MBIO. Um, okay, so as I was already saying, they alter these measures of species coexistence that have been considered fundamental property of the host alone. And so, so to me, this was, this was great because it was one of these things we all, I always say, you know, microbes rule the world, right? Microbes run the world. They're kind of the puppet masters of everything. And so in this case was, you know, even though it was in, in the, the modest example of algae in a flask, right? It was kind of showing us that this is indeed um, true. You know, how important that really is for the big scope of things we still have to figure out, but it definitely showed that they have um, an impact in how species in how their hosts interact with each other. Um, so kind of indicating that indeed the eukaryotic species interactions are not just a function of traits expressed by the eukaryotic host species, but also by their microbiomes. Now, there's a lot of follow-up questions there, some of which we're, we're addressing in, in this uh, proposal we're working on, but um, okay. So um, let's see where we are. Time here. Still plenty, I think. Um, I promised Trisha I was gonna talk slowly because she, was not going to be available during this and she was going to watch the recording and I promised I would talk slowly so she could play double speed but I think I tend to talk pretty fast so um, sorry Trisha if you're trying to do this double speed it's going to be hard. Um, okay so the last element I'll talk about is um, kind of similar experiments we've done but in the context of, um, of harmful algal blooms. Okay so these harmful algal blooms um, 
I'm talking in particular those that we uh, are struggling with in freshwater systems, which are cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. And so now we're shifting actually to um, uh, considering a particular type of bacteria, the cyanobacteria, which are um, photoautotrophic bacteria that are, that are really important in, in the oceans, but also in lake systems. Um, and so we're going back to this why care question, a second element. So the first one I said, understanding interspecies interactions in phytoplankton is important because they're the base of the food web and the diversity in the composition of these is likely important for overall productivity in these systems and understanding all aspects, all components that control species coexistence, including microbi how microbiomes impact things uh, is important. And also understanding what shapes these microbiomes and how important is the composition of these microbiomes, which are questions that we're working on right now, um, um, is important um, um, to kind of be able to predict what will happen, for example, when temperatures change um, uh, or nutrient regimes change, et cetera, on, on the outcome of, of host competition. Okay, so the other element um, beyond the good thing that phytoplankton does is that phytoplankton can also be pretty bad in the sense of these harmful algal blooms, which can be both due to uh, eukaryotic algae, as well as often in, in freshwater systems by cyanobacteria that produce toxins. Um, so cyanobacteria are part of a normal succession pattern in, um, uh, in North temperate freshwater systems and in, in many other systems as well. Um, but where things get problematic if, is when these become very large, much larger than they normally are. And also when the composition of that uh, of the cyanobacteria gets you know, changed into you know, very good, or good species that are you know, moving up well into the food web to organisms that are not a preferred food source and produce toxins. Um, so overall, globally, um, 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 you know, harmful microcystis, oh, sorry. Uh, so we, we focus specifically on microcystis um, which is a species or species group that tends to be the dominant organism in um, uh, freshwater um, uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms uh, all over the world. So that's the case for Lake Erie, um, but all over the world. And this kind of shows you a map of the world where blooms have been seen of these organisms. There was recently a case in I think Botswana where there was um, die off of hundreds of elephants, which they are likely tracing back to drinking of uh, from uh, pools um, where there were um, cyanobacterial blooms. In this case, it was not microcystin. Microcystis was a different species, um, but it's thought to kind of contribute to that. So these harmful algal blooms can really have major impacts on, on other organisms as well. Um, and so um, this microcystis, you know, which might be one species, there might be multiple really closely related ones, they're spread all over the world. And we have a lot of interest in that collaborative project uh, together with Greg and Melissa's groups and the people at, at Sigler and Glural on, on getting a better understanding of what explains this predominance of this one toxin producing organism in cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms all over the world. Um, oops, um, oops. And so again, uh, in the case of, of microcystis, uh, this is an image by a graduate student in, in Greg's lab where you see kind of a colony of these clusters of these microcystis cells. And then they have kind of this mucilage layer. And in that you see all these little dots, uh, this is a microscope image. Uh, and these are heterotrophic bacteria that are really closely associated in the mucilage of, of these colonies. Um, but similarly also, um, you know, they can be present, um, you know, at, on single cells as well. Um, and so, you know, quite a bit of work has been again done on, on and continue to be done on these, these interactions. We were particularly interested considering, um, you know, the patterns of um, succession that we see from green algae to cyanobacteria in, uh, in North Temperate Lake systems on the interactions between uh, chlorella as a model for a green algae, as a model of green algae, and microcystis aeruginosa um, uh, as our problematic uh, cyanobacterium. And to kind of see, again, similar to what we we're talking about before, when I looked at interactions between green algae, to look at what the role is of bacteria in potentially changing the interactions between these two species. So again, the question here is, do the interactions, so to what extent do the bacteria associated with these algal hosts influence these interactions? So without or with bacteria, did it get the same outcome? 
We again do a similar approach of these mutual invasion experiments where we have one established and then we add the other one uh, and vice versa, and then kind of uh, look at growth characteristics that way. Okay, so um, what you have here each time on these graphs, um, so is kind of the line that sort of stays at the top is the resident species. So this, this, in, you know, this species has been growing up from, uh, from low densities and is sort of at a you know, near steady state. Uh, and at that point at a lower concentration, we add um, the second species, so the invader. Uh, in these two panels, it's chlorella that's invading microcystis. And then here is microcystis invading chlorella. And what you see, the top ones are azenic, so without bacteria present, and then this is with bacteria present. Sorry, with heterotrophic bacteria present because microcystis is itself a bacterium, of course. Um, and so what we see here um, is that, oh, okay, we see chlorella is able to invade microcystis and microcystis is able to invade chlorella. Okay, cool. Um, however, when we add bacteria, now chlorella is no longer able to invade microcystis and microcystis is able to grow a little bit faster and to a higher carrying capacity um, than um, uh, in the absence of bacteria, okay? So this, in, in this case, it seems to, you know, before we sort of saw oh, these sensitivities get affected, you know, might or might not change the outcome of, of, of coexistence. But in this case, uh, the change was such that it actually completely blocked, the presence of bacteria completely blocked the ability of chlorella to actually grow in the presence of an established microcystis. Um, okay, so again, same conclusion to some extent, microbiomes alter measures of species coexistence that have been considered fundamental property of the host species, right? So microcystis becomes a more robust competitor in the presence of host associated bacteria uh, and vice versa, host associated bacteria impede the ability of chlorella to grow in the presence. However, to put a mark here, what I showed you there was kind of, you know, a, a partial view of all the data we have because these observations actually depend on the strain of microcystis used, and one could potentially argue on the strain of chlorella used. But we're particularly focused on microcystis. As I alluded to earlier, it's sort of a single species from based on many definitions that is present all over the world as a dominant species in these harmful oral blooms. And, but if you look a little bit closer, there's tremendous genetic variability existing within that. And so one of the things that we saw, um, what you see here now are two different strains. It's one, the same strain of chlorella, but now it's either invading, trying to grow in the presence of an established uh, strain PCC7806 or this other strain, which is PCC9701. Okay, so two different microcystis uh, aeruginosa strains. And what we see is that in one case, in AZNA conditions, chlorella cannot grow in, while in the other, in the presence of the other um, microcystis species, it can. And then, so this is the one I showed you earlier where chlor chlorella can invade without bacteria, but it cannot invade with bacteria. In the other strains case, chlorella can't invade in either case, right? So this kind of shows there's, a, there's an impact of the microcystis genotype on whether chlorella can intrinsically invade an established culture or not. And then yes, it's still true that bacteria influence this for the strain where chlorella can, uh, intrinsically invade without bacteria present, it can no longer when, when it's there. Um, vice versa for the other way around, microcystis invading chlorella, right there we see, okay, microcystis actually this particular strain here. So here chlorella could invade this strain, but this strain cannot invade chlorella, neither with or without bacteria. And then the strain where chlorella couldn't invade that strain in either case, that strain can invade um, uh, chlorella and is aided again by bacteria. So the first image I was showing you was simplified just to emphasize the impact of bacteria, but the, the story is more complex in the sense we're talking about two different strains here. Uh, and there's a genotype dependent effect, both of um, this interaction intrinsically, but also on the ability of microbes to change that interaction or, or with bacteria. And so there we have a, a series of projects going on in trying to understand better why that might be, right? And one way uh, we approach this, so you know, thus far, even though I built a lot of my earlier career on you know, using omics methods, you know, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, whatnot, um, to kind of get insights into the evolution and ecology of microbes in situ, uh, I haven't talked about it at all. And it's been actually a real joy to be back to being a, a regular microbiologist in the lab with isolating cultures and doing culture-based experiments, which get you, you know, a very 
uh, tedious sometimes to do, particularly these these azenic state cultures, culturing experiments, um, but but get you very nice direct answers. Um, and but again, at some point we stumble into the issue. We're like, okay, what's going on? And to be able to understand what's going on with these different strains of microcystis, um, we turn back to these omics approaches, um, which give us a, give us the ability to get an insight on how are these different strains different from each other. And so this was a project in collaboration with Ace Sarnelli and his graduate student at that point, Jeffrey White, um, and you know Sarah Jacquel and bioinformatician uh, uh, Jacob Evans were, were key in there as well. And so it was a series of lakes in, in Southern Michigan that, from which these colonies of microcystis um, were picked up. Um, by the way, the, the poster with the announcement that was a picture of a cat-shaped colony of microcystis um, that was uh, rendered into art. Uh, anyway, so these individual colonies are, were picked, which tend to, the idea was that they um, are mostly clonal coming from a single original cell, although our work indicated uh, gave us some insights and in actually the variability that might be there. But that's a whole separate story that I don't have time to talk about today. Either way, those colonies were picked, then washed a bunch of times, and then grown into an enrichment culture, um, which composed of microcystis as well as these associated heterotrophic bacteria. Then metagenomic reads were generated, which means the sample, the community was extracted, uh, DNA was extracted from the whole community, shredded into pieces, and then um, sequenced. Uh, we kind of reconstruct this kind of jumble of different jigsaw puzzles. Um, it's going to reconstruct them in uh, genomes that we can then trace back to um, uh, particular populations that were there. So the microcystis as well as different heterotrophic bacteria. Um, and so when we look at the variability that was there and try to put in ecological context, one of the things that we saw is that one of the causes of the heterogeneity we see among microcystis aeronosa populations is um, uh, intraspecific niche diversions are gone uh, along a nutrient gradient. So these series of legs that were sampled, uh, so this is a, a phylogenetic tree based on, on five housekeeping genes. Um, so a series of these isolates do, were derived from uh, uh, high nutrient legs. So the neat thing with microcystis is because it grows into a colony that is composed of hundreds of thousands of cells from you know, a single colony, uh, from a single cell, it indicates that there is a fitness of this organism in this environment. It's able to grow rather than sometimes when we do isolation work with bacteria, yeah, we pick up an individual cell that might or might not be fit to grow in that environment. While with these colonies, we know they were able to grow from nothing, from a single cell, sorry, it's not spontaneous generation here, from a single cell into a colony, many, many duplications so that indicated um, a fitness in that environment. So we had some that came from high nutrient, that forms sort of a clade over here, or a couple of clades. And then we had some that were um, from low nutrient lakes. And then we had this other set that came from high nutrient lakes, but clustered for a monophyletic group with these um, strains that were derived from, uh, from low nutrient lakes, right? So there was sort of this somewhat of an intermediate. Um, we also saw an interdependence so because we also sampled their microbiomes. We kind of could look a little bit what's going on there. What we saw is that there was taxonomic divergence between different isolates, also between different legs, et cetera, but also a genetic signal on the composition. Uh, when we looked at the functions that these different associated bacteria um, uh, contain, overall, it seemed like there was kind of convergence in the sense that even though taxonomically there might be different communities, they were very similar in what functions they carried. Um, but when we looked more fine scale by sampling a bunch of isolates from the same lake, so we like from the same, from the same water sample with a bunch of isolates from Gull Lake as well as Wintergreen Lake, which happened to be right next to it. Um, and then we kind of had the functional divergence between the host plotted here and the functional divergence of the host's uh, phycosphere, so the associated heterotrophic bacteria. Okay, what you see is a lot of noise on here, right? Uh, with a pretty weak um, R squared, right? So um, about 0.1, by 10% of the variation explained by uh, host functional divergence, which is pretty weak, um, but actually is very similar to findings for Aerodopsis and May's um, uh, rhizospheres. So the same order of magnitude of, of variation explained by host genotype. So indicating that there's some level of host uh, selection for certain microbiomes that complement it. Um, well, or is at least indication there. Okay, so but back to this tree of uh, the microcystis population, 
Well, there's an interesting thing because the initial question there was like, okay, why is this one population so dominant across all these different lakes? And also we're particularly interested why are there different outcomes in, in these competitive, um, in, this, in these competition experiments, uh, depending on the genotype. Um, so one consequence of this heterogeneity is that this winter green lake that I can highlight is a eutrophic lake. And we see coexistence of these low nutrient genotypes as well as the high nutrient genotypes within the same lake. Um, similarly, when we look at microcystis blooms, and this is kind of data here showing you the um, microcystis density um, uh, across time uh, in a couple of different stations in Lake Erie. So it's across you know, weekly sampling over a couple of months uh, during the, that the bloom uh, persists and then looking at toxin production over time. We already know from some of that work that was a collaboration including many people at Michigan um, in 2014, um, that, that there's sort of these transitions at least between these kind of toxic and non-toxic phases. And that also from other work that even within that there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity that, that is temporal, that is coexisting there at the same time. So we knew that there's multiple strains that coexist. We don't really know how. Um, and so one of the things we look back at in the Lake Erie data, and here we have our, that tree that I first showed you in sort of a, a vertical way, uh, is kind of flipped 90 degrees here. So we have our low nutrient adapted genotypes here and our high nutrient adapted genotypes here. Uh, and then these are sort of taking samples from the lake, extracting all the DNA from it, uh, and then randomly sequencing pieces of DNA and then mapping these back to these genomes. And then we try to make an inference of which of these strains or things related to those strains are present at different times. And we see a lot of high nutrient adapted strains kind of popping up uh, across different sampling sites. It's the colors here, uh, as well as over time, each time from August to October, uh, which makes sense uh, since Lake Erie is a eutrophic system. Um, but what we do also see is that there's some of these low nutrient types that are popping up later in the season at the offshore station, which is a, a lower nutrient, kind of again, indicating this coexistence of multiple types and which makes us sort of think that at least some of this um, strain heterogeneity that exists allows these blooms to extend sort of, uh, in, even when, it's when, when the bloom is depleting a lot of the free nutrients that are there, because there are some genotypes that are adapted to these lower nutrient conditions that allow the bloom to persist longer than if that wasn't the case. Um, okay, so that's sort of the co-occurrence and succession of multigenotypes underpin underpins this bloom persistence. Um, which traits underpin the succession overall is still to be determined, although um, you know, we have some insights on that. Um, 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 oh, sorry, uh, this, this kind of goes back to um, um, when we're talking, so I'm kind of mixing a couple of stories here together, so it gets a little bit confusing, but um, so we kind of see all this genetic variability. We have some traits that we kind of know about this low and high nutrient type that explains some of the things. That's not probably what explains the different outcomes in competition between chlorella uh, and these different genotypes, although nutrients might play a role definitely. Um, but uh, secondary metabolites, particularly toxins or other allelochemicals that might influence competition could play a role as well. We did do some experiments. These were led by Catherine Schmidt, who was an undergrad here at Michigan and a technician um, for a while afterwards, um, where she kind of looked at a knockout mutant that is no longer able to produce the main toxic that people care about in microcystis, which is microcystin. So it doesn't produce that toxicity. Um, and when people, uh, when she did the experiments, that toxin, which people had hypothesized could play a role in competition with chlorella, uh, it doesn't make a difference whether that toxin gene is present or not. So we kind of know a couple of things that are not underpinning the difference in, in, in uh, competition there, competition outcomes, but um, we don't know what is the explanation. But um, so we also have um, from those initial experiments also the importance of the microbiome modeling the outcome of competition. But again, you know, the exact mechanisms there is something that we're, we're still figuring out. Uh, the one last thing I'll, I'll pop up here is, um, um, so I've mentioned one project that we have ongoing now and we're writing a new proposal with, with Annette, uh, Nina and, and Brad, which is following up on the green algal work and, and you know, in a variety of ways. But on the, on the HABS work, we have a project funded by NOAA uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Greg's group, Melissa's group and the people at, at NOAA, Glorl and Sigler, where we kind of have an isolate collection where we're trying to look at a variety of traits around resource competition 
interference competition, defense traits, and stress response traits to link these back in uh, to models uh, modeling growth and death to eventually be able to get better predictive models for bloom composition, toxicity, and duration. And so some of the experimental work that I talked about today that Catherine did looking at these different genotypes and how competition plays out in different ways, how the microbiome plays a role, that all sort of fits in this um, overall picture of how we're trying to understand um, this genetic diversity that's there and its implications for the success of these blooms under particular environmental constraints, both of abiotic factors like nutrients, temperature, light, as well as biotic factors like the invasive species, as well as you know, different grazer populations like Daphnias in the system. Um, and the hope is by, as current models kind of don't assume that there is any genetic variability and don't work particularly well in simulating the blooms as they are right now, we hope that by getting more information on how different genotypic groups of microcystis are different in these key traits that determine growth and death, uh, that that can allow us to help them improve their models by adding a bit of complexity in considering multiple genotypes in function of um, the environmental constraints that are there through the seasonal succession um, uh, you know, to lead to, to better model prediction, which is necessary or better model development, which is necessary to be able to more fully capture, like say that we reduce the amount of phosphates that are going in the system and ask farmers to do a variety of things and changing practices. Okay, that presumably will reduce, in, uh, reduce the bloom size, but since we're changing the stoichiometry of the system, uh, particularly with regards to phosphorus relative to nitrogen, um, might this have some un unintended consequences that our models can right now not really predict because our models don't actually capture even what's going on right now. Okay, anyway. So that was just the last thing out there. Uh, and just last thank you specifically to the data I presented today. Um, all the names are there, but I will highlight specifically um, most of the work, experimental work was done by Sarah Jacquel, who was a postdoc in the lab for a couple of years and is now assistant professor at University of California, San Diego. And then Catherine Schmidt, who was an undergrad first and then um, stayed on as a tech and is now a graduate student at, at uh, Madison in, in Wisconsin. Okay, with that, if there's any questions, um, you can either throw them in the chat, I think, or um, um, you know, activate your mic and, and speak up, I guess. And here's that soul-sucking soul -sucking moment after you finish a class or after you finish a, a seminar of like silence. And, and little cube. Thank you, Greg, for the applause there. <laughs> <laughs> and little cubes. Hey, Vincent, I'll, I'll kick it off with one quick question. Yep. You, you um, highlighted the, the strain dependence of the microcystis chlorella interaction. Mm -hmm. I would also suspect that it depends on the microbiome composition. Do you have any data or thoughts on that yet? Yeah, so it's a really good point. Uh, how is composition matter? Um, we have data on how composition matters for single host physiology, not for microcystis, but for the, on the green algal side. Um, we have a lot of experiments in mind on, on how, to, um, how to do some of that on, on how the outcome might be different. Um, and so the composition of microbiome might matter also what conditions you're doing the experiment on under, right? What the media conditions are or, or, or abiotic factors. So there's many, many variables that, that, um, that could be changed that, uh, um, that could lead to different impacts and all of them are really interesting. And um, we have an isolate collection of about 400, 500 isolates of heterotrophs um, from the green algae um, that we're interested in. Um, um, but, um, um, you know, that, that we're doing, that we're planning some experiments on that, but um, yeah, no data to share at this point. Okay, thank you. Happily take any other questions, and otherwise, um, I'd be happy to go get my child from the childcare. <laughs> All 
All right, that's good then. It's four o'clock. So um, talk to you all later and see you in fall 2021, I believe I'll be back. <laughs> maybe, Thanks. maybe. Depends if you can get this dude out of office. Otherwise, I'm not coming back. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. Again, congratulations. Yep. See you later.